Hi, Misha here. And, well, this year I've kind of gone back over the SKS, some of the Mosins so far, and recently the SVT series, the Tokarev series of self-loading rifles used by Soviet Russia. So with that, I figured, you know, Russia was the single largest user of the whole submachine gun class in World War II, the Great Patriotic War, using nearly eight and a half million submachine guns between 1941 and 1945. Yeah, um, quite big. So, we're going to talk about them. And I will probably, definitely, split this into two parts. In part one, we'll talk about the lead up to and the development of the PPSH-41, the Papa Shaw, later known as the Burp Gun in the West. And in part two, we will talk about the PPS series, both the 42 and the 43. And we're going to look at influences and really what made these the best submachine guns of World War II. If not in terms of absolute individual quality of the guns, in terms of everything. Production, usage, cartridge. Yeah. So with that, let's just dive into the first part and talk about how we ended up with this very iconic gun. The story begins here with the C96 so-called broom handle Mauser and rather specifically with what we know as the Bolo model the shorter barrel and the fixed rear sight. Ignore the fact that this is a red 9 because what's important is the cartridge and yes I know I grabbed a hollow point oh well. The Mauser was actually very popular in Russia in the 1920s, hence Bolshevik, Bolo, along with its 7.63 by 25 Mauser cartridge, bottlenecked round. And this is actually where 7.62 by 25 Tokarev comes from, first created and used in 1930 in Russia. This was their new service round, and it did quite well out of a short pistol barrel, four to five inches. Of course, it wasn't so much a fragmenter as a penetrator, very high velocity for that day and time. Actually, an extremely hot little cartridge for the 1920s and early 1930s before even 357 Magnum existed. So they would adopt first the TT-30 and then very quickly the TT-33 pistol from Fyodor Tokarev, the gentleman we talked about in the last Russian video. Now they thought about doing a submachine gun and they had trials beginning in 1931 and running through 1932 and up until 1933 and they looked at a number of submachine gun designs. But the two that came up on top, well, one was from Tokarev again himself and another was from another very prolific and in favor was Stalin, who had recently come to power, arms designer, Digterev. Now Digterev had already been famous for his light machine gun, the so-called Stalin's record player, DP-28 or DP-27 if you wish, although it was just usually called the DP or DT or DPM later. These were the two main submachine gun designs. And Degaterev, he had already been working on a subgun since the late 1920s, having several designs. But what really won him the competition was what we would come to know as the PPD-34, because it was finalized in 1934 and adopted and put into limited production in 1935. Now it fired the 7.62 25 Tokarev round 
And it was an amalgamation of what was on the market at the time. Probably its primary influence, as with a lot of guns, was the MP28-2 Birdman submachine gun out of Germany, at that time still Weimar, Germany, which was based on the original World War I MP18. Now, I don't have an MP28, but I do have this British Lanchester, which itself was a copy of the MP28, but it is a side-feeding magazine gun. One of the changes that Dictrev would make would be going to a bottom feeding magazine which was featured on the Finnish KP-31 Suomi designed by Lati and also of course on the US Thompson submachine gun. So he liked the, the bottom feed idea. And originally the PPD-34 fed from 25 round box magazines double stack single feed not unlike the early Suomi's and even some of the early Bergman's well they fed from the old Luger artillery mags but that was a different story now it was not a copy of the Suomi or the Bergman straight out it did borrow elements for example it was on a machined tube and it did have a threaded end cap like the Suomi and it had a ventilated barrel jacket and it was a very well-made machine gun. It did have a quite an innovative safety feature for the bolt that we'll revisit in just a minute. So he did combine various things. It wasn't exactly that. It was a copy of one or the other. And I would throw up pictures if I were able, but you know what? I trust your Google foo. You can Google up PPD photos. It's a good-looking submachine gun, and it was very well made. It was... Uh, very similar to other submachine guns of its day and time, just about seven pounds unloaded, so relatively lightweight, all considered. It uh, had a barrel that was nearly 11 inches long. It itself was about 31 to 32 inches long. And of course, it had a fixed wood stock. Originally, a two piece design where you had a piece in the back before the magwell. Then you had your magwell, then you had a piece in the front that was for a handguard. And I kind of screwed that up a little bit. The original ones were actually a single piece. Apologies. Although it did split, it did bridge like uh, a lot of the Bergmans that were bottom facing. So sorry about that. I'm not going to re record this because, yeah, yeah, you get the idea. But the original PPD 34 had a single piece stock. Sorry. And. It would be very lightly produced in 1935 and 1936 because they had manufacturing difficulties. This was something totally new. And there was a controversy in the Red Army if a submachine gun was even worth it. As happened a lot in the Soviet you know, political apparatchik system, you often had two camps. Some saw the utility of a submachine gun. Others thought they were inaccurate and a waste of ammunition, bullet hoses. Nevertheless, production was finally started relatively at a high rate at Tula and Sestresk around 1937. But even then, they were only producing in smallish numbers. In fact, when World War II kicked off in September of 1939, Russia only had about 4,000 plus a handful of prototypes in inventory. And actually, the submachine gun had already been canceled. Yeah, cancel culture. It dates back to the Soviets. Who knew? Early in 1939, the camp that believed the submachine guns were a waste won out. And so the People's Commission and the Army, blah, 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 ordered that all orders be terminated from the factory. So we're not just going to let the orders run out. We're going to cancel them right away. On top of that, they ordered that all the PPDs that were exigent in the military be collected and tossed into depots. We're not going to do this. It's a waste of time, energy. We're going to go with other things. To keep in mind, they had just adopted the SVT-38 and Mosin 
9130 production had been highly streamlined. They just felt like they didn't need them. They were wrong, of course, and that would very soon become apparent. Now, sometimes having a dictator sucks. Sometimes it can be a good thing if right decisions are made. Now, Dikterev was very much friends with Stalin and in his good graces, and he absolutely did not like this idea. He went to Stalin, pleaded the case for the submachine gun, Stalin being an absolute dictator, and Stalin, and then we're right in the middle of the great purges too, no one's going to say no to him, reversed the decision, and so submachine guns were in the field, and production was started back up. And actually, right around this time, Russia decides, after invading Poland jointly with Germany, it'd be a fantastic idea to invade Finland next to Leningrad. Because they weren't idiots. They knew Germany was a threat, even though they were technically allied. Yeah, it didn't go well. Anyone who knows the Finnish war, the Winter War, even though Russia technically won, it was a pure victory, to say the least. And that's where Russia really saw the benefit of this gun here, the KP-31 Suomi. Finland used these to great effect in that war. And Russia went, oh crap, we only have a few thousand. What are we going to do? Dekterev had already been working on his gun, and a new version, the PPD-3438, was introduced in 1939. And it fed from a 73-round drum magazine that had a neck that would actually fit up into the, the hole in the stock. And the benefit to this was you could still use the original 25-round box mags. But, as with a lot of drums of that day and time, you really didn't want to load it beyond mm, 68, 70 rounds if you wanted reliability. And this drum was his own creation, but it was kind of a copy in some sense of the German drum magazine for the Luger and the U.S. Thompson magazine to a lesser extent. And these were put into production but really not that many were built. The Winter War, that's when Russia would see the Suomi, and more importantly, its fancy 71-round drum. Now, originally, the Suomi fed from box magazines, too. But they very quickly decided they needed more firepower. So they adopted this. And it's one of the earliest, most effective drums. Much easier to load and load into a gun compared to what the Thompson had. And much more reliable than the German magazine. Thanks in great part to not having a neck. It goes right up into the gun. So, after the Winter War, I don't drop it. Dikterev would have an emergency change to his gun in 1940 for it to use a new 71-round necklace magazine. Now, this is the PPSH 41 71-round drum. It is a little different than the one for the PPD, what would become known as the PPD-40, but close enough. And yes, it is almost a one-to-one -one copy of what Finland had. Here they are, side by side. Very same loading system. The only difference, of course, the PPD drum had to be wider for the new round. Now notice how it goes in. This is still a single feed system. That'll come up and be very important later. So the PPD-40 was all through to take the new drum, which meant it could no longer take the older drum or 
stick magazine. This is also when the two-piece stock came in to vogue ahead of the Magwell. This is also when Russia knew war was coming and they needed to streamline for mass production. The PPD wasn't the most expensive thing to produce, but it wasn't the cheapest. It was definitely a peacetime era gun, and everyone was simplifying. Uh, he kind of simplified the barrel shroud, going to fewer and longer ventilation slots. And the whole gun had been designed where it could be made on a lathe with pretty basic machine tooling. It, it, it was simple, but it was still machined parts. The rear sight was also simplified. But one neat innovation that the PPD-40 had, this was the first to feature a chrome-lined bore, which would be a very good thing for Russia considering the use and everything else. But that was the PPD-40. And this is when it would fully go into mass production, 1940 through 19, well, really 1940, with some in 1941. And they would produce about 90,000 PPD-40 models. So only a few thousand of the others, five, maybe six total, meaning total production is around 95,000, give or take, hard to get Soviet records, under 100,000, we'll say that. But it just wasn't suited for mass production in World War II. But we know what was. Enter Gorgi Spagen. He was a veteran of the revolution. After that, he became a gunsmith, a tinkerer, and finally, he fancied himself a gun designer. And by 1940, he thought he could make a submachine gun that was faster, easier to produce, that took less resources. And for this, he went to stampings. Now, the PPD design was pretty good. It could be built in eh, somewhere between 13 and 14 machine hours. It only had 95 parts. It was a simple design, all things told, and quite effective. But Schwagen thought he could do better. And in September of 1940, he finished his first prototype. And it would enter field testing and trials and whatnot between October and November of that year. At some point, going through a 30,000 round endurance test part on full auto and it would go up against the PPD 40 and a few other designs but on December 21st 1940 it was selected to be Russia's next submachine gun and that's what we have here so how did it differ and how was it similar to the PPD 40 why well, I've been talking about the PPD all this video so far and there's a good reason now that we're to it, these are both semi-automatic builds using original part sets done by TNW a long time ago. That's why you didn't see them in the Mac Arms video. And in the second half, we'll talk more about the semi-auto conversion because this video is going to be long enough without really getting into that. Anywho, what do we have from the PPD? Well, about the same length barrel, about 10.3 six inches so just a teensy hair shorter perhaps overall length is actually greater at about 33 inches and weight is a little more at about eight pounds unloaded with without a mag in it like the ppd what would become known as the ppsh 41 was select fire you had forward position automatic and rear position for single shot and it took the very effective safety system on the bolt handle from the PPD. Let me show you here. On this one, since it's a semi, you don't lock it in the forward position, otherwise you could blow your gun apart. But it will lock in the rear, like so. And the uh, military gun, you could lock it in either the rear or the front because 
This is a safety concern of submachine guns at uh, the time. But again, you can't do it on a semi-auto because if you were to lock it to the front and then pull the trigger and fire it, yeah, that probably not do good things. <laughs> it took the general single-piece stock system, but it just eliminated the front handguard altogether. And it had the same feed system using a modified version of the PT, PPD-40 magazine. And that's kind of where the stock shape and all that comes from. Now, interestingly, the original PPSH-41 design had an adjustable type rear sight, but that was very quickly done away with in 1941 to go to this very simple two-position flip notch 100, 200 meters, because that's all it's really good for. And just, you know, generally speaking, being a submachine gun, that's kind of what I took from the PPD, and of course firing the same 7.62 took what I have around. So how did it differ? The PPD, like the Xiaomi, had a threaded end cap on a tube. The PPSH did away with that, going to a two-piece design with a spring-loaded push button in the back to open it up. This had a lot of good advantages. It made cleaning and maintenance a lot easier, just crack it open. And it made, they didn't have to have a machine threading the end of the receiver, and it meant the receiver could actually be made of stampings. This is a stamped piece. The lower section was stamped, well, pieces put together. Internally, it had one recoil spring, and it had a fiber-style synthetic buffer in the back for the bolt. Yeah, very simple, elegant system there. The barrel shroud was very simple, stamping, that's why it's squared off. But one unique feature this had actually taken from later Xiaomi's, at least the concept, the SJR Xiaomi, was a very simple but reasonably effective muzzle brake built in to the shroud up here. That's why it has an angle cut to the front, essentially being a three-port muzzle brake. This is one reason the PPSH is a little bit longer than the PPD, because this adds an inch or so to the length. And that actually proved quite effective for the very low monetary cost in trials and testing. It improved accuracy by decreasing muzzle climb, especially in full auto. It did increase the uh, sound, as most muzzle brakes do, though. <laughs> by the way, of course, since this is a semi-automatic legal, this is a 16-inch extended barrel. Speaking of the barrel, from the PPD, it continued the trend of chrome lining. Something, even though in World War II they were under much duress to produce these, they kept on doing. The PPSH also has a very unique magazine catch. So here's our 71 round drum, about to go in has kind of guide rails and you notice the mag catch sticks it up and when you put the drum in it folds the mag catch that's a lock to let you know it's in there good and so you don't accidentally hit it out but if you need it just flip it down you have a very large with good leverage magazine release that was something they learned in the winter war was that Soviet conscripts were dumping their SVT-38 and even the few PPD-40 magazines that they had. So they wanted a bit of a magazine safety. I guess it's a different type of magazine disconnect safety, huh? So as we go into 1941, this has been selected to replace the PPD-40. And PPD-40 production was halted around April 1941. Give or take. My sling's gonna be in the way. Thank you. 
Got a couple of different mag pouches here too, if you didn't see them earlier. Just different styles. And the PPSH-41 was readied for mass production. And it was considered very important now, so much so that high party officials around Moscow were essentially put in charge of making sure it happened. In other words, if it did, they would get kudos. If they didn't, they would get a bullet, probably from a PPSH-41 or a Tokra pistol. But it took time because of the new stamping tech. You had to set up the stamping machines. The good news is once it was set up for stamping, almost any mechanical shop, which Russia had been pushing to create through the five-year plans, could do these. Almost everything is stamped on this gun. Well, not, not stamped wood. <laughs> Except, of course, the barrel, which could be turned on a lathe. And it does have a machined trunnion the barrel plugs into. And, of course, our bolt itself is machined. By the way, the top ejection system was something featured on the PPD-40 as well. So they would set these up, but, of course, June 22nd, 1941, Operation Barbarossa, Germans, bad things happen. The only PPSH-41s available that summer were just pre-production models, although some of them were used because they used everything they could. But it would not be until November the first production guns started to come out of the factory, and they had very much a um, pedal scheme, at least in British terminology. They weren't built at one, strictly speaking, factory. The parts were built all over the place, whoever could build them, and then they were assembled wherever they could be assembled. But by the end of the year, they'd already turned out nearly 100,000. And by the spring of 1942, they had built over 155,000. And very soon in 1942, they were turning out 3,000 a day. So even though it took a little time to set up, once they got rolling, they could produce the crap out of these. Because, well, when they needed to, they could build these in under six hours. It only had 85 part, or excuse me, 87 parts, so not a huge decrease from the PPD, but again, they were made from pretty simple stampings. Even the milled barrel, since it was the standard caliber, could be made by cutting down two 9130 Mosin barrels, or if you had a 9130 Mosin barrel that was damaged, say at the crown, cut it down and remake it into a PPSH-41. They did all kinds of crazy stuff especially in 1942, 1943, when they needed these. And, of course, wood stocks. You could get anyone to carve a wood stock. It's just held on with a simple screw. We do have a trap door in the butt plate, which is kind of neat for a cleaning kit. A little bit of a fanciness there. But the chrome line barrel really did help keeping these clean. And, by the way, originally, these were all shipped with two... 71 round drums, but they had to be serial matched to the gun because they were fitted at the factory. One problem with some of the early drums for the PPD, they fit too loosely and therefore feed was meh. So they wanted these to fit securely, but also be easy to insert and withdraw, not too much fighting with them. So they had to do a little bit of fitting. Not ideal, but, but what do you do? And as is pretty famously known, you didn't want to load them all the way up to 71 rounds. Uh, 70, excuse me, 64 to uh, 68 was plenty. Most soldiers, you know, around 65, give or take. But because of the backloading system, that was easy enough to do. So, by early 1942, these started to make their way to the front and the troops. Now let's put our 35-round stick magazine in. Not as iconic is the drum. It was a better magazine. Typically carried in three a uh, three cell pouch. But it never really fully replaced the drum during World War II. This was uh, first accepted for service in February of 1942. 
but it would take some time for these to reach the front. And actually in November of 1943, they would introduce an improved 71 round drum. Originally, these were about 0.5 millimeter thick. They would up that to one millimeter. You can probably understand why that would be an improvement. And those started to hit the field in 1944, so it was kind of a combo. Typically, a soldier would keep the 71 round drum in their gun burst that off and then have one or two three cell pockets of 35 round magazines to reload with typically but i think the advantages of a 35 round stick mag it's half the capacity but it's faster to load and reload more reliable and of course it's cheaper to make the only real detraction, let me pull another one out here, is because of the design, it's using the same magwell, the same receiver. This is still a single feed design. It's a double stack, but a single feed. Which means, A, well, if you're gonna load it fully, you typically want to use a loading tool. You can do it by hand. I did it last night. My thumb is still a little sore. But it also means feeding isn't the best and these lips are a little prone to getting bent and wonked off. These are made from pretty thick steel as well. So anyway, yeah, by 1942, these are under huge mass production and they start to equip platoons and even whole companies it was great. The 7.62 took rev round really does great out of a 10 inch barrel. And that allowed very good velocity range, much more than 9 millimeter. Now it did have a pretty high rate of fire, anywhere from 900 to 1000 rounds per minute, which is a double edged sword. But thankfully we had pretty good feeding devices. We could keep it running quite a while. Now, with the drum, she was a little heavy, about 12 pounds. With the stick mag, that dropped to about 9.5 pounds. And again, unloaded, about 8 pounds. So, not the lightest thing in the world. In fact, heavier than a Tokarev rifle. But, you know, you get what you get. But these are great, not just for infantry attacks and urban warfare, but also for defending tanks, typically when you would have a tank coming in, especially as they started to march on Berlin in 1944, they would be defended with some riflemen, usually one sniper, or DMR, and then one guy with a flamethrower, and then a bunch of guys with PPSH-41s, because, yeah. This is where it kind of became affectionately known as Papa Shaw, or the Daddy, because of uh, just the alliteration of the name in, in Russian. Sh is uh, a Russian character in the alphabet so it is properly pp sh the the sh is the uh, romanized the american the english translation so it's still only technically three characters in russian and it is not s just that i thought that there's a uh, uh, spagen his name basically it just means spagen's handheld machine gun uh, submachine gun but these were mass produced throughout 19 19- 43, 1944, and just became the symbol of Russian infantry. And they were also given to Russian partisans behind enemy lines. They were small enough and light enough they could airdrop these. They were also given to foreign troops fighting in exile. For example, the, the first Polish army, Czechoslovakians used them, etc. By 1944, Russia could spread them around a pretty good bit and production would continue at a very good clip through the end of the war now it is worth pointing out after 1943 they would improve production a wee bit just taking a little more time to finish parts get a little nicer blowing so production time went over seven hours at least machine time Woo-hoo! but it was a nice gun uh, very little 
needed to be changed. It it just worked. It was simple. It was durable. And it was pretty easy to train conscripts to use because it is still a basic rifle type stock. A pretty simple trigger select system. Pretty simple safety. And the 35 round mags really do well. The drums were about as good as a drum was going to be in World War II, but they had all the shortcomings that a drum would have. So production would continue until the end of the war. They would build about 5 million by May, June of that year, and they would continue at a lower rate. And by lower rate, I mean they only built about a million between that time and when production was officially suspended in 1947. So the, yeah, by Russian standards, that's low rate production, 500,000 a year. Yeah, giving us a total of about 6 million <laughs> as best we know. Again, these were made everywhere they could make them, especially in 1942 when they were evacuating across the Urals. And uh, it was really just a convergence of already having worked on the PPD having the absolute best cartridge available at the time for a submachine gun and frankly just a nation that had no other choice they had to mass produce these and so they did because it was their very survival and luckily Stalin was always kind of in favor of self-loading rifles and to lesser extent submachine guns so it had political support and well this certainly gave Spragan a place in Russian history and many, many accolades and just became one of the most iconic guns, not just in Russia, but of the entire World War II period. And once more with the Dreminer, because I know that's what you want to see. This really was one of the first machine gun conversions to semi-auto that I was interested in because the first time I held one it just it felt so very Russian and so very good it's not perfect of course it is pretty sloppily made especially by 1942 in that that time period it does have a very high rate of fire troops love the fact that it was easy to maintain but of course in the snow mud ice you had to make sure the action kept clean, otherwise it could have issues. So they had to do things to protect it when they were in transit. And it was not all that accurate. It was okay, 100, 200 meters, but if you press it past 300 meters, no, no, it was just, it wasn't, it was, it was a spray and pray type gun. But when you have massed infantry, again, whole platoons or companies, armed with these, that'll do. Probably a very terrifying thing. And the muzzle brake, you can see it's solid on the underside, did help somewhat with that. And it was still select fire. But it was relatively long by submachine gun standards. It did require wood, and it was quite heavy. Again, 12 pounds with a loaded drum which is more than a grand, more than an SVT-40. So there was room for improvement, and that will get us to part two. There we'll talk about other submachine guns Russia used, and look at these semi-automatic conversions that I've shown you. But I think that's enough for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, it's, it's a really fun topic, the PPSH, the Papa Shaw. At this time, it had not quite earned the nickname Burp Gun, though. <laughs> that would have to come a decade later. But until then, if you please could like, share, subscribe, all that wonderful stuff. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to the Patreon page. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.